you are very welcome. Do travel home safe. Farewell. After you, my dear. I thank you, my dear. Oh, well, now that the majority of our guests have left for the evening, we might engage in this informal conversation with you. We are so pleased that you have decided to stay and keep our company for a bit more time. It, it has been a rather raucous evening, has it not, my dear? It most assuredly <laughs> has. Now, uh, I suspect you know who we are, but all the same, let's indulge in introductions. Uh, it has been my privilege for these last several years to serve as your Chief Magistrate, President James Madison, at your service. And I, his wife, Dolly Madison, at your service. Well, I suspect you are acquainted with the hospitality that we have offered these last several years, yeah. although I suspect we must offer some apology. Mm -hmm. In this winter of 18 and 15, we find ourselves here in the home of Mr. Taylor, the Octagon House, due to circumstances which I, I suspect the whole of Washington is aware of at this present moment. A fine home. Uh, we've been graciously invited into the Octagon House. Uh, Mr. Taylor and his wife have graciously offered the accommodations as for these months have been difficult as you are well aware. Uh, and Mr. Taylor is a friend and uh, occasional rival as well, but <laughs> that is the case of Washington, is it not? It is indeed. Although it has been our goal these many years to gather people as we are able in, in our home. Uh, those, uh, as you've mentioned, my dear, usually we've called them squeezes every Wednesday night, though tonight, as you can imagine, is quite different. Uh, uh, gathering people in our home, inviting them Mr. Taylor and, and, and those agreeable with our politics alike. Uh, we are pleased, though, that you've been here with us this evening. Yes. <laughs> No, it has long been the hope of our administration uh, to endeavor to reunite these ties that have long been severed. For the better part of these last 20 years, our politics have been fractured by that spirit of faction so baneful to free societies. Uh, during the term of my predecessor, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, that spirit of party was so terrible that very rarely could our worthy friend bring two parties together at the same table. Rather, instead, he would host the Federalists upon one night, mm. the Democratic Republicans upon another. And, well, regardless of my worthy friend's attempts, uh, it would always end in, well, more fracturing. Mm. And so, uh, when the Madisons were elected in 1808, for indeed I do say that the Madisons <laughs> were elected, it was our hope to do something different. Mm. Now, I will say, and you likely know, I, I am not a terribly social creature. I have been called by my friends as shy, which is true. I have been called by my rivals and a great many ladies before meeting my <laughs> darling companion as cold, and that's also very true. And I was called uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Patrick Henry, the most unsocial imp of a creature who has ever existed. So when I stood for the office of president, well, there were a great many gentlemen who far exceeded me in charisma. So you therefore must be astonished as to why I won. Well, the credit could be attributed uh, to a phrase issued by one of my political opponents, Charles Cotsworth Pinckney. Upon losing, he said he would have had an easier time standing against James Madison if he didn't stand against James and Dolly Madison. And indeed, from the very first days of our administration, we have been moved by a spirit of conviviality which can transcend above party. Mm. Our Wednesday night squeezes were hosts to well, members of every party, but also uh, members of different nations. Mm. Uh, ministers plenipotentiary from France, from England, and all sat to enjoy not only Mrs. Madison's hospitality, mm. but her cake, her ice cream, and well, her cup ever overflowing with <laughs> wine and libation. Which is um, why I suspect the events of these past six months have been so hard. Uh, you, of course, are aware of this war, which, for the better part of these last three years, has further caused strain, not only domestic, but equally abroad. A, a war which is being fought in our Western territories, upon the high seas, and, well now, upon the streets of Washington. This past August, the British, having achieved a no, somewhat embarrassing victory in Bladensburg, Maryland, marched into the streets of Washington and torch 
in hand, set fire to the people's home, the presidential mansion. Now, by the grace of God, myself and Mrs. Madison were not there, although, my dear, you almost were. I nearly, uh, if it weren't for Mr. Carroll, dear Mr. Carroll, encouraging my fleeing, uh, I would have been there, indeed. I was there much of the day, of course. I, I wrote a letter to my sister as the day went on, eagerly awaiting his return from Bladensburg. I even had a, had a, a dinner of, of about 40 places set out for the return. Uh, my, as the day waged on, I realized that, that perhaps there would be no return indeed. Uh, and as I looked about our home, one that we had worked very hard to build, not for ourselves, you understand, of course it is a home we made for ourselves, but in particular uh, worked to craft a home, a presidential mansion that was representative of those ideals that we worked so hard to, to instill in the American people throughout our years in the Washington city. And as I looked about our home, I thought, what shall I do? And uh, what shall I take? And I wasn't, of course, not alone. I had um, my, my slave woman, Suki, with me and Jean-Pierre and Paul Jennings. Uh, many people there, um, Mr. Carroll, of course, arrived shortly thereafter. And, but I did realize that much of the decision-making would be up to me. And uh, in your absence, my dear, I did what I could, but it saved some small silver, of course, uh, small items of our own. Uh, I mean, there are many other things that could have been saved. Uh, my, my worthy wife, you are being far too modest. She speaks of saving small things, but the things you saved belonging to the people, well, those are anything but small. Thank you, my dear. I kept looking at the, the portrait of George Washington uh, painted by Gilbert Stuart, and I thought, how terrible would it be for that to fall into the hands of the British? And uh, truthfully, I, I made a decision quickly. I thought perhaps it could be broken off of the wall. The, the frame was fixed to the wall. And of course it was needing to be unscrewed and it was uh, going to take more time than we had. Uh, so I did instruct for it to be removed. Uh, it was cut from the frame eventually, so taken safely by those gentlemen from New York. And um, indeed, uh, it was no noble, no noble feat, as you say, though, my dear. I, I just could see no other option, truthfully. And as I looked about, thinking of what could be saved, of course, our, my dear Polly, bird, my, my parrot, and um, the, 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 the most precious things, I kept thinking, as it has come back to me this week, what is to be salvaged, you know, when we first moved to Washington City, uh, many years ago, it was nothing but a sheep's meadow. Do you remember? Uh, I do recall <laughs> a, a great many foreign ambassadors came here not to talk matters of spa state, but to enjoy the grouse hunting that <laughs> they found upon the grounds of Washington. <laughs> she, I mean, it was it was muck and hunting, and truthfully, I enjoyed my time at, at your family's home um, in Montpelier. But uh, I had high hopes of Washington City. This city that was to be the seat of our, our government, the seat of our democracy, representative of what we all hold to be most dear. And, and truthfully, it was a bit of a mud pile. And we have worked many years uh, to craft this place, this whole city, not just the grounds in which we walk. But I, this week I find myself feeling much like I did in the ruins of this attack from the British. I feel much like I did that day in our home looking around, thinking about, well, what is to be salvaged and how do we move forward? And you know, this, 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 this country that we have built is placed on symbol and the individual. And I, I look around and think, my dear, I hope I am not, I am not waxing too sorrowful, but I look around and wonder what, what shall we do next? It, <laughs> well, I will say, being the pragmatist that I am, that it is fair to assume that you and I, as the president and his wife, may never stand within that august house again. Mm -hmm. No, our time in that home is but ashes, but 
I suspect this is the glory of America. You see, in our late war, our first war for independence, capitals were seized consistently, a people on the run, yet at every instance, never did we cease marching. And in that we find the spirit of America, a people who find symbols not in grand houses, not in great monuments to men, but instead in ideas. Ideas cannot be burned, but instead ideas can burn within the hearts and the minds of a people, and such is the nature of this experiment, wherein these various ideas can take root in the hearts and minds of every person, be they of any color or condition, be they counted as citizen or not, for in this age there are a great many to whom the title citizen does not apply, to which these private rights and public privileges cannot be attributed, and yet such should be the hope of America that we may see an age where, if we are enlightened, this idea can continue to spread. And I will say this war has tested that idea, has tested the Constitution of the United States, the rights afforded by our Bill of Rights, has tested those who aim to serve it. And yet I will say from the ruins of this great attack, a people have risen to the call of America. Not just the call to stand in her defense, but to unify as a people never before had. We have seen more factionalism, I suspect, my dear, factionalism should ever be synonymous with America. But in spite of all of that, we see a people who dare braver and who speak kinder. Upon the war, reaching speedy conclusion, I must ask favor of you, Mrs. Madison, would you do the kindness of entertaining our guests for this briefest oh, moment? There are some letters that require my attention that I should wish to see, and then I will return both to you and to you presently. Yes, indeed, my dear. Very Take good. your time. Mrs. Madison, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, he has a magnificent way with words, does he not? I dare say, well, these months and years have have worn on him, but he is as hopeful and as um, powerfully present in this nation as I have ever heard him before. He does not lose doubt. Mm. And I must say, my friends, I do not lose doubt either, though I find myself to be fatigued with all of these matters, I, I do not lose doubt. We have worked so hard these many years. You know, my husband spoke upon factions in our home and and I, I mentioned the individual in this democracy of ours and I am quite proud of the time that we have spent building that that strength of democracy within the people. And I don't mean within the broad, sense of people, I mean within each person that has walked into our home. For does this democracy function without a strong individual, a person who feels empowered in their government, a person who knows that what they say has to matter, and that what matters to their family matters to the, to the government that, that represents them. And I dare say I'm quite proud of the work we have done, though many people are divided. I, I believe that when people enter our home, they feel as though they matter. And though they share ice cream with their political rival's daughter, they feel that she matters as well and that her needs matter. And is that not what this democracy is founded upon? The rights of each other, the rights of your neighbor, the rights of yourself. And if you protect your neighbor's rights, then you protect your own. And what better way to see a person's desires and wants and rights, but to share something with them in a, in a home lit by hearth and candle, uh, by the, the sparkle of a wine glass and the laughter of a joke. I am quite proud of what we have accomplished. And as my husband said, though it has seen some difficult times recently and we will need to do some rebuilding, I, I believe that it will be there for us when we return. Hmm. I cannot help but agree, Mrs. Madison. Oh, Mr. Now, Madison. I hope you will pardon me. I, 
I was stepping back into the room when I was so struck by what you were saying, I did not wish to interrupt. <laughs> I was waxing. Waxing um, romantic, I think. No, indeed. <laughs> indeed I, I found myself wholly transported. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder you should not stand for Congress. Ah, well, perhaps I shall someday. One day, we can only dream. <laughs> No, I, I, I will say I, I find myself wholly overwhelmed uh, by the amount of letters and notes that require mm. my attention, so I confess we only have perhaps a, a few minutes of your time before we must turn you out and retire for the night. <laughs> but I, I will say, through the course of all of that, uh, reflecting well, not only upon this term, but the previous term and all the years prior to that, I should not be where I am uh, were it not for you. Mm. Mrs. Madison, I have walked with this nation every step since its beginning, espoused in my youth the various political ideas of scriptures of government that come from a people. And yet through the course of all of that, I, I suspect I never truly understood human nature, <laughs> what it was, what mattered, until I met you. Mm. I will say I, I know you fancy the city far more than you do the country, but I will say I look forward to leaving this city, retiring to my native land, to be in possession of solitude, <laughs> contemplation, to worry over only my fields and nothing else, mm. to live amongst the symmetry of nature, rather than endeavoring to make nature subordinate to our wishes, mm. the life of a farmer. But rest assured, my dear, I suspect we should never want for company. We can have as many house guests as you want. That's very good. <laughs> I shall be invited. I have already begun inviting them. <laughs> I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Oh. Now, can you fathom this, my worthy friends? When we arrived first to this city, oh, I, well, I suspect at the turn uh, uh, of this century. Yes. After the election of eighteen hundred, we arrived as so many did by by carriage. Uh, there are many ways to get into the city by your own two feet, by hoof, by boat, and yet, well, I suspect when we leave this city for the last time, we shall not do it by horse, but instead by steam. Mm. The various innovations we have seen every day continue to confound, and through the course of all of that, we see progress that every day seems mm. to outlive us. Mm. And yet I will say, the things that matter, the true things, well, they never change. Yes, indeed. Yes, John. Oh, do you mind, my dear? I shall now abandon you with our guest. You're going to leave me uh, alone. John, oh, well, he will be just fine, oh, I know. God help him. John Freeman needs my assistance. Oh, very good. I shall Mrs. return Madison. shortly. My worthy wife wears a smile better than any woman alive. And yet I will say this porcelain mask of conviviality she has worn has received more than a few cracks this year. Oh, when the doors are open, when the crowds rush in, she has a smile that will shine brighter than any evening star. And yet when the crowds depart, when she is left alone with me, there she allows that mask to fall. There we see the sadness that comes from all that hath been endured, of not only the hardships that have taken place, but the criticism of well, a baneful and at times envious country. I will say I, I have grown accustomed to what the press may say of me, what the public might say, yet it has never been easy to see what they say regarding my wife, a woman who at the end of the day just wishes to see a people happy. I will say I, I could not have endured the better part of these last several years were it not for her. No, indeed, I barely survived this time as president. I will say in 18 and 13, I felt ill for the better part of a season, and Mrs. Madison, rather than surrendering to circumstance, instead managed to simultaneously rest by my bed while simultaneously taking up my letters. I will say our presidency has been a partnership, and that has set us apart, I think, by any other previous administrations. I must sit and wonder, looking back at the long career, the career that began at the age of 25 in Williamsburg, Virginia, carrying through the revolution, our war for independence, 
I must sit and marvel what America has accomplished in its short time. How, in some 40 years, it has set a standard that already is spreading throughout the world. I must sit and marvel that when I was born, we lived in a world where people needed kings. How now, looking back, we look at a world that is everyday question. A world where people are beginning to take these responsibilities in government to be their brother's keeper. I must sit and, and wonder how this example may benefit the world, how it might be the hope of liberty and happiness through all mankind. I must wonder if America may accomplish what it has in 40 years, what might be done in 240. Well, I suspect that is a question for tomorrow. Ah, my dear. My oh, dear. Ah. A business is cared for, of oh. course. Thank you for forgiving my absence. Uh, that John Freeman was an excellent purchase. Uh, uh, purchased from um, Mr. Jefferson. Of course, you are well aware of this gentleman of, of who I speak. Uh, uh, John Freeman uh, has been resistant. Um, he has been enslaved to the, the presidential mansion for as long as it has been built, truthfully. Though his contract is from Maryland. It is a fascinating thing, and he is resistant to leave leave our federal city for all of his family is now here. Uh, I mean, he has taken care of business just as I instructed him to, and his service uh, shall be sorely missed upon his freedom. We are training up Paul Jennings, of course. Uh, he's a, a teenager, um, a, a slave that we have had in, in Brought from Montpelier, I believe. Yes, he has spent the majority of his life in, in service in the city. I must wonder if, well, uh, our people who have grown accustomed to the responsibilities of keeping a city house should have a difficult time adjusting, mm. uh, of not only uh, learning what is required of a country seat, but just as easily relating to the, the field laborers who have always known that way of life. Yet I must wonder if they will simultaneously to be as grateful of leaving the octagon as we. Uh, mm. uh, their health has been poor due to the, the close nature The slave's of this house. quarters are in the basement. It's a rather peculiar thing. It's very damp. And uh, my Suki, my uh, slave woman, my maidservant, has not been ill, for she is with me uh, most of the time, though she has been uh, somewhat ill, not as ill as the others. Uh, yeah, close quarters, damp quarters. Uh, we are very grateful for the hospitality of the Talos, but we shall be quite eager to depart. <laughs> but we do hope you won't tell Mr. Taylor. No, we indeed, we trust that. you. <laughs> yes. And if it does get out, we'll know it was you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dear, I, I suspect the hour does grow late. Maybe. While we still have the light, I, I should turn to my study indeed. and uh, the taking of letters. Uh, but we hope that this house, as long as a Madison lives here, will ever be open to you. And moreover, we, we genuinely hope that this new year, this year of 18 and 15, uh, brings with it to you and to your family all the comfort, all the knowledge, and indeed all the liberty that had ever belonged to an American citizen. Until we meet again, uh, we remain your humble servant, uh, President James Madison. And Dolly Madison. Good day. A pleasure, my friends. It shall be, my dear. Yes, indeed. I shall allow you to help me out. Oh, well, <laughs> this is Madison. <laughs>